tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. FX's AHSNYC is the next installment of the award-winning anthology series, American Horror Story, created by Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk. For the first time ever, this season takes place on the streets of New York as a mysterious unidentified killer begins targeting the underground club scene, leaving a trail of ecstasy and death in its wake. AHS NYC stars returning favorites like Zachary Quinto and Billy Lord, along with some fresh faces, including Russell Tovey and Charlie Carver. If you love a good scare like I do, then I recommend watching this right now. Something Evil is Coming. FX's AHS NYC is all new Wednesdays on FX. Stream on Hulu. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling tales for dark nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about devious decorations and muffled messages. I'm your host of the evening, Drew Blood. And tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of the Vespers Bell and P.D. Williams are voice talents Eric Peabody and Danielle Hewitt, Nick Garoff, Olivia Steele, and Jeff Sturdivant. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds. Embrace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale of the evening is written by the Vespers Bell and is performed by yours truly, Drew Blood, Melissa Medina, and Melissa Exelberth. We all know someone or are someone who loves decorating for Halloween. And with the stores advertising for Christmas earlier each year, the earlier you decorate, the better. This tale is about a decoration that wasn't bought at any store or even asked for. So on that note, without further ado, I present to you Jack-O-Lantern Man. I live in a picturesque little housing development overlooking the Avalon River, just a short drive away from Sombermory. It's surrounded by enough woods to muffle out the sound of traffic on the adjacent highway, and the road leading into the neighborhood is so discreet that delivery drivers regularly have trouble finding it. It always felt safe to me, secluded an isolated little bubble that the rest of the world seemingly couldn't find even if they wanted to. But that changed in October. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Generation Y, a podcast by Wondering. 
Hi there, I'm Steve Taylor, and for true fans of true crime, the Generation Y podcast is essential listening. Hosts Aaron and Justin started this podcast in 2012 to dissect some of the craziest and most notable murders, crimes, and conspiracy theories together. And 10 years later, they're still at it, unraveling a new case each week. Delve into the history of true horrors from the safety of your headphones. The two go over every single angle, breaking down theories, diving into deep forensic evidence, and interviewing those close to the case. And honestly, it feels like you're in the room with them while they get into it. I mean it. The immersion quality is just amazing. Follow the Generation Y podcast on Amazon Music or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus on Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. It was a gorgeous crisp fall day. The leaves on the giant maples and oaks that surrounded our neighborhood were just starting to change colors, and I had gone out to get my mail from our pair of community mailboxes, the newer ones with the wind-blown maple leaves emblazoned on the side. As I stepped out, however, I noticed that there was a small impromptu gathering of my neighbors on Mr. Kukowski's front lawn, fawning over something that I couldn't quite make out. Whatever the commotion was about, I figured it was probably worth delaying getting my junk mail for a few minutes, so I casually walked over to inspect the spectacle for myself. When my neighbors saw me approaching, they politely moved aside so that I could get a clear view of whatever it was that had them so enamored. It was a jack-o'-lantern man. A snowman made out of jack-o'-lanterns. There were three hollowed-out pumpkins stacked on top of each other, and together stood about five feet high. The top pumpkin had been carved with a fairly stereotypical jack-o'-lantern face, but the bottom two had been carved so that it looked like the figure was dressed in a brocade 19th century suit. Is that... real? I asked incredulously. While it was obviously completely possible for it to be real, it seemed far more likely that it was some sort of mass-produced plastic Halloween decoration. Oh, it's absolutely real, Mr. Lacombe. Lorella Nisley assured me excitedly, her eyes shining like it was Christmas morning. She stuck her finger inside the jack-o'-lantern's mouth, ran it along the inside, and pulled it out to reveal still fresh seeds and pulp. See? I stepped closer, intentively poked the fleshy fruit of each of the three pumpkins. They looked real, felt real, and smelled real, and thus I could only conclude that they were, in fact, real. These are remarkably intricate carvings, I muttered as I ran my hand along the middle pumpkin. I glanced up towards the elderly Mr. Kukowski, who looked like it was taking everything he had not to yell at us to get off his damn lawn. You didn't make this, did you? What do you think? He asked holding up his clearly arthritic hands. No. The damn thing was here when the sun came up. Someone must have dropped it off in the night. Very peculiar. My gut reaction is that it was a prank of some kind. But the thing's too beautiful for that to make any kind of sense. And no one else saw anything? I asked, turning around to face the rest of the neighbors all of whom shook their heads. I'll look over my security footage later, but I don't think it'll have a very clear view of Kukowski's place at night. Heidi, Lorellyn's mom, offered as she used a wet wipe to clean Lorellyn's hands. I'll send out some emails and put a notice on the bulletin board asking about it, but I'm sure it's just a surprise Halloween decoration. If it is, it was poorly thought out. This thing will be a pile of mush by Halloween, Kukowski said with a shake of his head, giving the pile of pumpkins a disdainful whack with his cane before turning to go back inside his house. You'd better damn well find who's responsible for this before then, because I'm not cleaning it up. Wait, Mr. Kukowski, I want to get a picture with the jack o lantern man while we're all out here together. Lorellin pleaded, excitedly waving her phone in the air. Kukowski stopped in his tracks, 
hung his head, and let out a theatrically reluctant sigh before turning around and joining the rest of us for a group photo. Lorellin posted the picture she took of the jack-o'-lantern man on her Instagram, and I decided to run a reverse image search to see if I could gain any insight about who made it. The results were unexpected. I thought I would get results for a local craftsperson or something, but instead the algorithm matched it with a picture on heroichallows.net, a local paranormal discussion forum. The picture was a black and white illustration from an old newspaper article, maybe as far back as the 19th century, depicting a much more monstrous and ferocious looking jack-o'-lantern man. According to the poster, the jack-o'-lantern men started inexplicably appearing in a nearby, though suspiciously nameless, hamlet on October 1st. There were exactly 30 homes in the hamlet, and each day until Halloween, a new jack-o'-lantern man would arrive in the wee hours of the morning, with no one ever seeing where it had come from. That detail unsettled me a little, since our housing development also had exactly 30 homes. Anyway, all manner of misfortune started to befall the sleepy hamlet, and the increasingly paranoid villagers blamed the orange interlopers. They tried destroying or moving them, of course, but each morning they'd be back like nothing had ever happened. Some of the villagers, children at first, but later some adults, claimed to have seen the jack-o'-lantern men moving around at night, wreaking as much havoc and destruction as they could without getting caught. Naturally, the villagers' hysteria grew stronger the closer it got to Halloween, fearing some sort of inevitable climax on the 31st. Some fled, of course, and some stayed, but ultimately it didn't matter. None of them were ever heard from again. There were no physical remains, no signs of violence or bloodshed. They were just gone. The rest of the forum thread was just increasingly bizarre and baseless speculation about the nature and veracity of the event, and it quickly became silly enough to put my mind at ease regarding any similarity to my current situation. I didn't give it any more thought until I came home from work that night and saw that the jack-o'-lantern man had been lit up. It struck me as odd, given Mr. Kakowski's seeming exasperation with the thing, but maybe one of the neighbors had lit it up instead. The next morning, when the sound of Lorellin's joyful, excited cries came in through my open windows, I tried to deny that they filled me with an ominous sense of dread. I cautiously stepped out my door, and sure enough, there was another jack-o'-lantern man in our neighborhood. It was right next door to Kakowski's house, the Cranner's place, number two Willow Wood Crescent. It wasn't identical to the previous one either, clearly made from three real, once-living pumpkins with its own distinct design carved into them. I don't suppose anyone saw where this one came from, did they? I asked without much hope as I approached the crowd of onlookers, its size surpassing the one from the day before. No one. It's pretty damn weird when you think about it, Jeremiah Craner remarked, more confused and concerned by the jack-o'-lantern man's presence. This thing's not exactly light, but there are no marks on the lawn from someone dragging it, like it just popped out of the ground where it is. Oh, do you think they're magic? Lorellin asked, jumping up and down. They're mysterious, Lorellin. Let's leave it at that for now. Jeremiah replied non-committedly, not wanting to crush her exuberance. I'm going to ask my Aunt Samantha to come look at these. She's a witch, so she'll know if they're magic. Lorellin proclaimed. Sweetheart, we've been over this. Your Aunt Samantha is not a real witch. Lorellin's mother reprimanded her gently. She was just lonely, got taken in by a new age cultist, and now works for her as a brainwashed fake psychic. Lorellin rolled her eyes at her mother's rationalism, but didn't argue with her. Hey, Kukowski's stack of lantern's been moved! I heard Tyler Yablikov shout. We all turned to where he was pointing. And sure enough, the jack-o'-lantern man was now right up against Kukowski's front window, peering inside. There were no signs of it being hauled across the lawn, not one blade of grass out of shape. And yet, there it was, as though it was as portable as an inflatable Halloween decoration. Lorellin excitedly ran over to the jack-o'-lantern man and began knocking on Mr. Kukowski's window, 
only to scream when she saw what was inside. Her mother and several others immediately ran over to see what was wrong, and as Heidi comforted her daughter, the others either called for an ambulance or tried to break their way into the house. Kukowski had suffered a massive heart attack and was lying dead on his living room floor when Lorellin found him. The EMTs estimated his time of death as just after sunrise. The prevailing theory among the neighborhood was that the sight of the jack-o'-lantern man at his window had been what triggered the heart attack, and most of us wanted to know who was responsible for it. No one wanted to fess up, and I decided to keep the urban legend I had read about to myself, so no one really had anything to go on. But even without knowing about the legend from Harrowick Hallows, a lot of people suspected that another jack-o'-lantern man would be gracing our neighborhood come October 3rd. Everyone who had anything that could be used as a security camera made sure they were set up and activated, and pointed toward house number 3 if it was possible. We also coordinated a watch around our work and sleep schedules as much as we could, ensuring we had the best chance of catching whoever was responsible for these things in the act. That night, as I kept my vigil on my porch, I saw the lights in both jack-o'-lantern men spring to life, even though I knew nobody would have dared to light them now. Come October 3rd, there was a grand total of three jack-o'-lantern men, and the first two, while still on their original properties, had moved as well. None of our cameras had caught their movement, and by now we were all starting to get seriously unsettled, Craner most of all. If these things were here to pick us off one by one, then it made sense that he'd be next. Tyler was the first one to try to get rid of the damn thing and called some of his friends to help him load them up into his pickup truck. I don't remember where he planned on taking them or what he was going to do with them because it didn't matter. Before he could even get out of the neighborhood, one of his back tires exploded. He lost control and crashed into a street lamp. Nobody died that day, and Tyler himself was fine aside from some whiplash, but that's when most of us became convinced that these things were cursed. Each day, a new jack-o'-lantern man would appear at the next house and the ones who were already present would have changed positions, all without being seen or recorded. They didn't decay as the days ticked by either, always appearing as if they had been freshly carved. Dogs hated them, but they were probably just picking up on their owner's unease. Nobody wanted to try moving them again, not after what happened with Tyler. There were no more heart attacks or car crashes after that, but the threat the jack-o'-lantern men posed still loomed over us all. Each morning, we'd regularly find things broken or missing, the jack-o'-lantern men seemingly to blame. They had a tendency to block off driveways, doorways, and garages, or sit in flower beds or play equipment. It was almost as if they were daring us to move them, but we just worked around them rather than risk it. We didn't talk about them much after the first couple of days, and never within sight or earshot of them. We had come to a general consensus that they were trying to troll us, to egg us into somehow disrespecting them to give them license for revenge. It was around the middle of the month when Lorellin came knocking at my door. When I answered her, I found her standing next to a woman with long red hair, clad in a long red dress and cloak with a pentagram necklace and triple moon belt buckle on prominent display. Uh, I'm gonna go out on the limb here and guess that you're her Aunt Samantha, I presumed. Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm Samantha Summer. I'm a metaphysical counselor and spiritual wellness advisor at Evans Eden of Esoterica in town. She spoke confidently, as if those were actual valuable credentials. It wasn't hard to see why Lorellin's mother had described her as a brainwashed fake psychic. Lorellin asked me to stop by and take a look at the jack-o'-lantern entities that have been manifesting in your neighborhood. Yeah, they've just been popping up one after the other all month. No one wants to just come out and say it's supernatural, but it's pretty damn weird we've never been able to see who's doing this, I admitted, 
awkwardly rubbing the back of my neck. Well, I can confirm for you that all of these jack-o'-lantern entities are definitely paranormal. She said with confidence. I've been honing my clairvoyance for the past three years now, and there's no doubt in my mind that these jack-o'-lanterns are serving as earthly bindings for some manner of non-human spirits. The bindings are strong enough that they can at least manifest some minor misfortunes, and I suspect that at night, and when no one's watching them, they might be able to manipulate the jack-o'-lanterns directly. I see, I nodded, humoring her at first, but unable to deny the fact that I had no rational explanation for how they were moving or getting fresh candles. Well, do you have any idea why this is happening? Unfortunately, no. I have found records of at least one similar event over a century ago, but I wasn't able to find any clear cause for that either. She admitted. What I do know is that these kinds of spirits demand respect. Don't try to move or damage them, and they'll have no cause to retaliate. You can also buy some goodwill with a token sacrifice, like a coin or a piece of candy. And Samantha and I have already fed Halloween candy to each of the jack-o'-lanterns that are already here. And I'll feed any new ones to try to keep them from hurting anybody else. Lorellin said doggedly. She was clearly still shaken by Kakowski's death. Hell, I was too. And it was kind of heartwarming to see how determined she was to keep the rest of us safe. I smiled warmly at her, while her aunt gave her a consoling pat on the back. Is there anything I can do? I asked. Just avoid disrespecting the jack-o'-lanterns, and when yours appears, be sure to honor it with a small sacrifice of some kind. Samantha replied. For good measure, you can make a sacrifice to the rest of them as well. Uh, avoid them at night as much as you can. They're stronger when the veil between the physical and spiritual planes is weaker. It's weaker at night, and it will be the weakest of all on Halloween. I don't know what's going to happen on Halloween, but if you can avoid offending them, I think you should be okay. If you like, I can perform a blessing on your home that should make it a little harder for any malicious spirits to harm you, no charge. With a reluctant sigh, I let the potentially crazy woman into my house. She did a little ritual and left me with her business card in case I wanted to invest in any of the protective charms they sold as well. They did make me start to wonder if the whole thing might have been some elaborate guerrilla marketing campaign, but I couldn't deny that Samantha did seem sincere in her convictions. I watched through my window as she and Lorellin went over to the Tyler's house, only to be shooed away like Jehovah's Witnesses. He was still pissed with the jack-o'-lantern men over his truck and neck, and I knew he wasn't going to follow their advice. Somehow, that gave me a very uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. The next day, I and probably everyone else in the neighborhood was woken by the sounds of Tyler's cursing. He had gotten his jack-o'-lantern man, and it had appeared on the roof of his truck. It seems they had finally crossed a line that one of us couldn't abide by, and I watched helplessly as an enraged Tyler climbed up into the back of his pickup truck and furiously shoved the jack-o'-lantern man onto the asphalt below. The pumpkins cracked, but largely remained intact, which Tyler apparently thought was a fate too good for them. He grabbed what I think was a monkey wrench from the toolbox in his truck and just started pulverizing the thing, stomping its hide until it was mush. He was so engrossed in his vengeance that he didn't notice when the parking brake to his truck suddenly gave out and it started rolling down his inclined driveway. I watched as it swerved, seemingly without cause, and crashed into an electric pole. I'm not a physicist, but there's no way that truck was moving with enough kinetic energy to topple that pole. And yet somehow, that's exactly what happened. I heard it snap like a tree from a bolt of lightning, and saw it fall forward into Tyler's house. Hot power lines snapped, flailed about wildly, and started a fire that would burn Tyler's house to the ground. Even in broad daylight, the smoke and flames from that inferno could be seen for miles. 
Tyler was devastated, of course, but more than that, he was terrified. A lot of us were terrified. We had no reason to think that burning down Tyler's house would be enough to sate the jack-o'-lantern's need for revenge. For all we knew, Tyler was a dead man, and we might all be next. The day after the house fire, Tyler's jack-o'-lantern man was in one piece again, holding a marshmallow on a stick over the still smoldering rubble. A lot of us decided to leave the neighborhood after that, at least until after Halloween, but not me. I honestly didn't think running away would do any good, and if anything, I'd just be putting innocent bystanders in danger. I stayed, placing spare change into the mouths of each and every jack-o'-lantern man, exactly as Samantha had said. Today, October 30th, the last jack-o'-lantern man appeared, and it appeared on my lawn. I'm at house number 30, you see, right across the street from Kakowski's house, since it's a crescent and all. I slowly pulled back my curtains, knowing it would be there, but dreading the confirmation nonetheless. It was the worst one so far. It was bigger, too. Bigger than I was in both height and girth. Its face was a monstrous, sneering gargoyle, or maybe more like a Japanese oni. Its bottom two pumpkins weren't carved to resemble an outfit, but rather medieval depictions of hell, embellished by the candle glowing inside it. I noticed then that not only it, but all the other jack-o'-lantern men had their candles lit in the daytime, and they were burning brighter than they ever had before. Knowing what I had to do, I steeled up my courage and went outside, a bowl of Halloween candy in hand. I fed my jack-o'-lantern man first, then went door to door to feed the rest of them. Laurelin's family was among those that left, and I promised her I'd keep making offerings to the jack-o'-lantern men. I fortified my house a little, but what happened to Tyler's place is proof that won't stop them. I can only hope that we've managed to appease them. They're all here now, all 30 of them and they've got one night left to do whatever it is they're going to do. Tomorrow it won't be children, but the jack-o'-lanterns doing the trick-or-treating. And I can only hope that our treats will be enough to stave off their tricks. I hope you enjoyed Jack-O-Lantern Man, as written by the Vespers Bell, and voiced by myself, Melissa Medina and Melissa Axelberth. If you enjoyed what you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured authors can be found by visiting our website. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash the Vespers Bell. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash authors slash T-H-E dash V-E-S-P-E-R-S dash B-E-L-L. Other works by him can be found on Reddit at r slash the Vespers Bell and on Amazon at Kindle dash store dash Vespers dash Bell. His creations, The Star Sirens, can be found in the novella Madness is Like Gravity, and tales you've heard this evening, among others, can be found in his upcoming Heroic Chronicles, Volume 3, due out this fall. And to hear more narrations from yours truly, head on over to my podcast, Drew Blood's Dark Tales. And be sure to check out my official playlist at the Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel. Just click Playlists and find Drew Blood. Our second tale of the evening comes to us from author P.D. Williams and is performed by Danielle Hewitt, Nick Garoff, Olivia Steele, and Jeff Sturdivant. Donnie and his girlfriend, Shannon, pull into the ragged and empty parking lot of Miller Motel. After securing a room for the night, they argue, and Donnie drives away, leaving Shannon alone. But the horror is only beginning. A disembodied voice and other unsettling noises are emanating from one of the walls. By the time the terrifying ordeal ends, 
she will experience the horror that exists beyond the decrepit wall. Now, without further ado, I present to you, The Girl in the Wall. Donnie, when are we going to stop? I'm tired and I need to pee. Shannon and Donnie, her sometimes boyfriend, had been driving for hours. They'd left Georgia for Arizona two days earlier and still had a ways to go. The trip was more of a desperate escape than a journey toward new adventures. Donnie was deep in debt to the wrong people, and losing his job hadn't helped. It had been a rough going for a while, until he learned that hope and hard work were no match for dumb blind luck. He'd talked to a cousin who had a friend that might have some construction work in Scottsdale. Donnie had nothing to lose except the thumb that his rookie, Ramon, threatened to take in place of his gambling debts. He hoped that a change of scenery and a fresh start might do him some good, and save him some appendages. So Donnie packed a few of his favorite belongings, such as Shannon, and hit the road. He prayed that that iffy motor in his worn-out 2010 Ford Mustang would last the distance. He hoped Shannon would as well. Twelve hours in, Shannon needed a break, if only to have somewhere to throw up. She was sick from the exhaust fumes leaking up through the filthy floorboard, and regretted the 36-ounce bladder buster soda she'd gulped down around hour 10. Seriously, Donnie, I need to stop somewhere. Fine, we'll stop at the next motel. That make you happy? Yep, that, a commode, and a nice long shower. No sooner had she spoken than they approached an exit on the interstate. A sun-bleached road sign displayed icons indicating that a bar, a gas station, and a motel were within a couple miles. Donnie followed the long, winding off-ramp to an empty stretch of two-lane road marked Highway 21. A sign posted at the confluence showed that the motel was located 1.5 miles down on the left. Everything else? To the right. Donnie headed toward the motel and glanced at the odometer to mark the distance. As he drove, a horrid stench blew through the air vents. It reminded him of untreated sewage. Shannon crinkled her nose. Ugh, man, what in the world is that? It's too quiet out here. I'm gonna find something on the radio. Shannon pressed the auto seek and watched station numbers flash without stopping. Great. We're so far out in the boonies, you can't pick up anything. Just grab one of them CDs and pop it in. If I have to listen to any more Jason Aldean or Foo Fighters, I'm going to jump out and walk. All right, but don't whine about how quiet it is. Resentment lingered as they continued along the desolate highway. The road was dark. No streetlights, houses, or passing vehicles. Donnie strained his eyes against the night, unable to see beyond the reach of the headlights as creeping shadows swallowed their dim rays. A thick tangle of trees and tall grass closed in on either side. As they pushed on, a ghostly carpet of white mist rolled over the asphalt as if to welcome them. I don't like this, Shannon said. It's creepy. Hey, you're the one who needs to pop a squad and get some sleep. You want me to turn around and look for someplace else? No, I, I can hold it a little longer. Shouldn't we be there by now? The sign said it was only a mile and a half. Donnie checked the car's odometer. Hmm. What's up? Odometer says we should have been there five miles ago. Well, I didn't see anything with lights on. That sign's probably wrong. Just keep driving. I'll tell you when I see something. Several minutes later, they still hadn't reached the motel. That's it. I'm turning around. Donnie announced. As he looked for a place to make a U-turn, he saw a glowing light in the distance. As they got closer, he could make out a block of bright letters levitating in the soupy night air. Is that a motel sign? Oh, Shannon chirped. I think that's it. Thank God my back teeth are drowning. Donnie slowed and turned into the motel's parking lot. Fissures snaked across the ragged asphalt, whole chunks missing like rotted out teeth. The motel was a drab, one-story brick building with a neon sign above the door of a small office. Some of its letters were dead and gone, but enough of them remained to let Donnie and Shannon know they'd be spending the night at Miller's Motel. Donnie eased the Mustang into one of the parking spots nearest the door. He was about to kill the engine when something dark ran past his side of the car. You see that? See what? Donnie turned off the motor. Stay here a sec. I want to check this place out. He got out and looked around the vacant lot. The air was hot and stale, abandoned by the wind. 
The fetid odor from earlier was stronger here. Although he didn't see anything unusual, the eeriness of the scene disquieted him. It reminded him of the feeling he would get when he boarded an empty elevator and a stranger stepping inside at the last minute. Is everything okay? Shannon yelled. Donnie gave the area another once-over. It's all good. Just a little white line fever. Come on, let's get checked in. Shannon got out of the car and took a few steps before stopping. <laughs> Whoa. This joint looks like something out of a slasher movie. If I wasn't so worn out, I'd pee behind a bush and keep moving till we found a Holiday Inn. Relax. Ain't nothing gonna grab you. As soon as they entered the cramped lobby, a sour scent of stale mop water and lemon air freshener encompassed them. One of the two fluorescent tubes inside the overhead light fixture flickered, creating a strobing effect. No one was manning the small Formica counter that served as a front desk. There was a closed wooden door a few feet behind it. Hello? Anybody back there? Donnie hollered. You got customers up front. Just a minute, please. A whiny voice answered. Be right with you. The door opened and a short chubby man in a white dress shirt appeared. The sweat-yellowed fabric worked in tandem with overburdened buttons to restrain an overflowing belly. A plastic pocket badge with Leonard imprinted on it complimented the seedy ensemble. What'll it be, friends? Donnie and Shannon took a step back to get out of the range of the clerk's body odor, a noxious mix of armpits and halitosis. We'd like a room for the night, Donnie said. I believe we can manage that. Leonard reached under the counter and grabbed a plastic binder, from which a pen dangled at the end of a long string like a condemned outlaw. Placing it on the counter, he flipped through some dog-eared pages until he came to a blank one. He spun the binder around to face Donnie. Just put your name and a phone number I can reach you at at that top line, please. Donnie snickered. <laughs> You're kind of old school, ain't you? Don't you got a computer? Internet access? No service this far out, Leonard explained. We don't see a whole lot of business, just the occasional one-nighters. Like you two. His sly wink made Shannon uncomfortable. Yeah, I figured that much by looking at your parking lot, Donnie said. What do I owe you? I don't know. Whatever you think's fair. Seriously? Leonard leaned over the counter and said in a hushed voice, Look, the owner doesn't always come around and you two look dog-tired. So how about we do... Twenty dollars? Sound about right? Sold, Shannon declared. Donnie laid a bill on the counter as Leonard retrieved a key from the hook on the wall. Here you go. Room 11. Let me know if you need anything else. I'm Leonard. I'll be here all night. When you go out, hang a left. Numbers on the door. Shannon thanked Leonard and she and Donnie headed for the room. Along the way, they swatted through swarms of moths, orbiting around the bare light bulbs on the side of each door. When they got to the room, they rushed inside before the squadron of insects joined them. An unpleasant smell greeted them, dank and pungent, a stink of pot and sex lingering from previous occupants. Donnie flipped a sticky light switch, and a lamp snapped on. The gaudy room looked like it hadn't been remodeled for a very long time. The furniture was worn, old, and cheap. Grimy shag carpeting accentuated fading, peeling wallpaper. So, Shannon said, this is what a $20 room looks like. Donnie surveyed the squalid accommodations and shook his head. Don't you have to pee or something? You better know it, cowboy. Shannon made a beeline to the bathroom. Donnie pulled back the tacky covers on the queen-size bed, exposing a dingy, threadbare sheet. Though a bit road-weary, he felt a pulsing in his loins. There was something about being with Shannon in a cheap motel room. He stripped to his boxers, climbed under the covers, and waited for her to return. The bathroom door swung open and Shannon walked out. She stopped and looked at Donnie lying in the bed, a look of hope plastered across his grinning face. You're kidding, right? He flipped down her side of the covers and patted the mattress. Donnie! I told you I was tired. I'm gonna go get my bag out of the car, come back, and wash off. Then I'm going to sleep. Understand? Flushed with disappointment, Donnie threw back the covers and jumped out of bed. Fine, then. You do what you want. I'm taking off. Shannon glared at him. Where are you going? I know good and well you ain't gonna leave me here in this $20 outhouse by myself. Donnie hurriedly got dressed. I'm gonna find a bar. You take your stupid shower... I'll have some fun tonight, with or without you.
He fished his car keys out of his jean pocket and stormed from the room, slamming the door behind him. Shannon didn't think he'd actually leave. When she heard the Mustang's engine revving, she panicked. The thought of being alone at the isolated motel filled her with dread. She ran from the room and headed to the parking lot. Shannon arrived just in time to see the red taillights of the car peering back at her like two devilish eyes. Donnie Jackson, don't you leave me here! He kept going. Donnie, you're a dead man! As Shannon sulked in the now empty parking lot, she noticed a large shadow forming on the edge of the woods across the street. It floated across the parking lot like an ominous cloud. Suddenly, all the night sounds ceased. In the quiet, Shannon thought she heard breathing. She spun around, expecting to see that creepy desk clerk behind her. But there was no one. As the shadow passed in front of the lone streetlight at the entrance to the motel, the light dimmed. Shannon furrowed her brow. The temperature dropped noticeably. She could see her own breath. Enough of this mess. Shivering, Shannon trotted back to the room. She locked the deadbolt and then closed the room's thick curtains. She looked through the door's peephole. Jeez. How'd it get so cold? She wondered if her uneasiness about being stranded was playing tricks on her mind. It's probably just a cold front. Still, she couldn't deny that something felt different. Threatening. The mist was so weird. She waited, half expecting a knock or to see the mist wafting under the door, invading her lungs and filling them with dry black dust. Keep it together, girl. You're way overthinking this. After several minutes, nothing happened. She inched her way back to the window and peeked through the slit between the curtains. There was nothing outside, just the parking lot. She allowed herself to relax a bit. God, I need a drink, but a hot shower will have to do. Shannon was about to look around the room for her toiletry bags when she realized it had accompanied Donnie to the bar. Thanks, jackass, she hissed through gritted teeth. She made a silent vow to never let him see her naked ever again. Shannon removed her cell phone from her back pocket and tried calling him, but as Leonard had said, there was no reception. Well, that's just great. Guess I'll have to make the best of this dung heap. Shannon looked at the ancient tube television sitting on the dresser, wondering if it still worked. It didn't. This sucks. She plopped on the bed and stared at a brown water stain on the ceiling. She amused herself by attempting to figure out what pattern it reminded her of. As though she were taking a discount Rorschach test. Hmm. It kind of looks like a cross between a bird and a star. That, or a plop of poop. The noise came from within the wall. Must be mice, she muttered. Hello? Hello? The voice was faint, a whisper in the air. Shannon sat up. The knocking traveled from the bathroom. Shannon shivered. The combination of the mist, the cold, the curious tapping, and the disembodied voice was making her apprehensive. Easy girl, let's go in there and get to the bottom of this. She slid carefully off the bed and stood motionless, concentrating. Hello? She murmured. Shannon was hoping there'd be no response. That she could chalk everything up to frazzled nerves. Hearing nothing, she remained still, quieting her breath. The profound absence of sound made her think of being underwater. Seconds ticked by. She tensed. The dull rapping emanated from the other side of the wall. She tiptoed closer. A muffled, childlike voice penetrated the sheetrock barrier. Can you hear me? Please say yes. Shannon chuckled. Oh my gosh, it's only a little girl. Did you say something? Shannon considered whether she wanted to start a conversation with the mysterious child. What might this little girl's parents think if they caught her communicating with a stranger? Bless her heart, she's probably lonesome and bored. Just keep it short. What's your name, sugar? I'm Melissa. Who are you? Hi, Melissa. My name's Shannon. I guess you're my new next door neighbor. I didn't hear y'all pull in. When did you get here? A, a while back. A brief pause, then. Really? We just got here. Was the weather acting up when you arrived? It was doing something freaky earlier. I don't remember. Can you keep me company? Shannon hesitated. Now that she'd satisfied her curiosity, she didn't want to get hooked into a long conversation. I'd like to, honey, but I'm getting ready for bed. Nice talking to you, though. The child said nothing more. Shannon assumed that she'd either gotten bored or feared her parents busting her. Shannon went back to the front room and laid down in the bed again. She closed her eyes, allowing the stillness to relax her. 
Shannon popped up. She took a moment to catch her breath. Who's watching that brat? That's it. I've had enough crap thrown at me tonight. Shannon sprang from the bed and hammered on the wall with her fist. Hey, why don't you people watch your stupid kid? I'm trying to rest over here. Her outburst drew no reaction. Yeah, you better keep it down. Shannon's hollow belly was complaining. I wonder if there's a vending machine around this dump. She felt around in her front pocket and found a couple of dollars. With some effort, she managed to push aside the earlier weirdness in the parking lot. Releasing a heavy breath, she said, Okay, here we go, and headed to the door. She stopped halfway when she heard a child crying. <laughs> Shannon followed the sound to the bathroom wall. It wasn't pained or a what-do-you-mean-I-can't-watch-TV sort of cry. It sounded mournful, frightened. Her annoyance turned to genuine concern. Melissa, is, is that you, sweetie? The crying ceased. Melissa, are you okay? Please don't hurt me. The small voice begged. Shannon froze. Who's she talking to? Was the child in danger? She pressed her ear against the wall. Soundlessness filled the space within. Help! Shannon, help! Shannon jumped back. She had no idea what the situation was next door. I can't even call 911. No! Melissa hollered. Don't do it! Something smashed against the wall and Melissa wailed louder. Shannon's instincts kicked in. I'm coming, Melissa! Shannon bolted from her room, ran next door and began banging on the door of room 10. Melissa was screaming. Somebody was tossing furniture. Hey, leave the kid alone. Suddenly a blanket of quiet dropped. Shannon kicked the door. You better open this door or I'll knock it down. She expected more yelling, but none came. It was as if someone had hit the stop button on a recording. Shannon was shaking with anger, panting from exertion. What in the Sam Hill is happening in there? She tried peeking in the window, but couldn't see around the heavy curtains. No light bled through the narrow opening. She heard only cricket songs and the soft fluttering of moths' wings. She turned to the parking lot and realized there was no other car there. Her neck tingled. She wanted to get back inside quickly, to feel the comfort of life. After securing the door, Shannon sat down at the round, wobbly table under the window to think. I don't like this. Thanks, Donnie. As angry as she was at him for abandoning her at the sake of his entertainment, she couldn't remember a time when she wanted to see him more. Shannon, are you still there? Cold swept over her. Don't answer her. Just ignore her. Maybe she'll go away. I think he just left. Please, I need you. The child pleaded. Whoever you are, this ain't funny no more, Shannon said. Leave me alone or I'll call the cops. Or at least I would if the stupid phone worked. But he's coming back. There was genuine fear in the girl's voice. Despite the strange happenings, Shannon wondered if she might be dealing with a child abduction, or, given her anxious state of mind, if there was a little girl at all. She couldn't be sure. I think I'd rather be dealing with ghosts. But her conscience wouldn't let her rest. Shannon went into the bathroom and stood at the wall. Melissa, who's coming? The scary man. I don't want to be here anymore. Please, help me get out. Shannon's heart thudded. Is there any way out of there? She bit her bottom lip. She could use a chair to break open the wall and free the captive girl. But what if the man was still there? Melissa, I'm going for help. You need to be very quiet. I'll be back soon. But I'm scared of the dark. I need some kind of light. Shannon licked her dry lips. She knew she needed to bring help, but she hated the idea of leaving Melissa alone crying in the black room. Shannon, are you there? He's probably close. Please hurry. I'm thinking. I have an idea. What if I dig a little hole on my side of the wall while you dig one on yours? That way we can meet in the middle. Then I can share your light. Shannon considered Melissa's plan. It might give the frightened child some comfort while she went for help. Honey, is there anything in there you can dig with? I don't know. I can't see anything. Just feel around. I'll look for something over here. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Friends, modern civilization is a 
dumpster fire. Everything's so complicated with today's technology. You can't go five minutes without an issue. Every website wants a username and a password. Every email is from a shadowy organization trying to lift those passwords. Chatbots friend you on Facebook and send you bizarre text messages about their underwear. A Nigerian prince wants your bank account info and routing number to send you $10 million. When you go to look for it, you've misplaced your checkbook. You call the bank, but you've forgotten your PIN number. Seriously, how is a guy supposed to function like this? I need that money. Yeah, problems. Everyone's got them. The good news is there's a tried and true way to help you become a better problem solver. It's easy, it's convenient, and it's affordable too. It might be the one breath of fresh air in this dumpster fire of hot garbage they call modern technology. You guessed it. It's BetterHelp Online Therapy. Have you ever noticed how many successful people use therapy? It's tough to stay in problem-solving mode when life throws so many challenges at you. But a therapist can help you become the best problem solver you can be. So let's become one of them, shall we? The successful people, not therapists. Here's how it works. After filling out a questionnaire on their website, you'll be matched with a hand-picked therapist within 48 hours. All your correspondence is remote, so there's no need for office visits. You can text anytime and get timely responses and advice. You can schedule weekly phone or video calls instead of physical visits, whichever suits you better. You get the benefits of traditional therapy without the extra cost and inconvenience. Of course, it's not just for problem solving. Whatever the problems you're dealing with, from anxiety to depression, family issues, stress, grief, etc., therapy is a great way to get your life back on track. There's a good reason millions of people have used BetterHelp. It's time-proven treatment using modern-day technology the right way. So before you go nuts and start swearing at chatbots, take a deep breath and remember, one good decision leads to another. Also, it's a robot. You are not going to hurt its feelings. You need therapy, folks. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Shannon searched the room quickly, hoping to find something small and breakable she could use to penetrate the sheetrock. Turning up nothing useful, she returned to the bathroom. Melissa. Did you find anything? No, did you? No. Then a thought came to her. She scraped the decrepit wall and a wisp of white dust floated around her fingertips. Look, this sheetrock is old and thin, so we might be able to dig it out with our fingernails. I'm gonna scratch on my wall. When you hear it, follow the sound and start digging. Okay? Get ready to listen. Shannon scratched the sheetrock at a height she thought a little girl might be able to reach. She paused to check on Melissa. Do you hear that? It's about four feet from the floor. Yeah, I heard you. I know where you are now. There was relief in Melissa's voice. I'll start digging. Here I go. Shannon began chipping away at the drywall. As she suspected, the sheetrock was brittle, so she had little trouble breaking through. She poked her index finger into the hole and wiggled it around so Melissa could better locate her. Melissa, feel around for my finger. The child said nothing. Sweetie, do you hear me? Feel around for my finger. Shannon? Yeah, darling? He's here. <laughs> Something grabbed Shannon's finger and yanked it with enough force to dislocate it from her knuckle. The pain was immediate. She jerked her disconnected finger back, but the hold on it was too strong and made her skin stretch like a rubber band. There was a loud crunch as the digit's middle joint snapped upward. Shannon howled. Leave her alone! Yelled Melissa. The attacker applied a tighter grip on Shannon's L-shaped finger and tugged the rest of her hand further into the wall. Let me go! Shannon squealed. Melissa was sobbing. I can't make him stop! 
Shannon realized that if she were going to have any chance of rescuing Melissa and herself, she'd have to act quickly. Using her good hand, she punched a hole in the weakened wall and then grabbed the arm of her attacker. Run, baby, run! Another large hand seized Shannon's arm and began squeezing, its sharp nails puncturing her skin. She thrashed around like an animal in a trap. The needle-like pain in her arm grew as the fingers clawed deeper into her stinging flesh. She wailed when the hand fully penetrated her arm, taking hold of the bone underneath. Shannon grunted as mind-twisting terror hammered at her. She put her foot against the wall for leverage and readied herself for the explosion of agony that was to come. As she pushed away from the wall, her arm made low snapping sounds. Her nerve endings were on fire. Screams burned her vocal cords. Suddenly, the grip relaxed. Shannon flew backward and crashed against the opposite wall, nipping her tongue, the tang of blood coating it. She dropped to the floor and forced herself to assess the damage. Her arm looked like someone had filleted it with a dull knife. The bone in the middle joint of her index finger had ripped through the skin. A flood of thick crimson poured from the wound like an open tap. Small white dots swarmed her vision. She tried crawling from the bathroom, but the blood and ripped tendons from her shredded arm made her slip. The wall split from the holes down to the floor and pulsed outward. A tall, cadaverous figure in a tattered black suit pushed through the crevice like a malformed baby. The spindly horror had no eyes just deep black holes weeping maggots. Its nose was two horizontal slits from which a syrupy discharge oozed. With its drooping skin and long gaping mouth, it looked like a caricature of a screaming corpse. It turned and lowered its bald head toward Shannon. Come with me. Shannon's deafening shrieks reverberated in the blood-splattered room. Shock overtook her ruined body masking the pain. With the torment temporarily at bay, she tried crawling with her useless arm again. The thing laughed, deep and gravelly. It grabbed Shannon by her ankles and pulled her toward the opening. She dug the fingernails of her crippled hand into the tile. The broken finger turned around in the opposite direction as the nails from the remaining fingers snapped in half. Shannon went into shock. Mama. 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 She mumbled. The thing threw back its head and screamed, a cacophony of terrifying sounds rushing from its throat. The labored breaths of the otherworldly fog, the ghostly whispers of the terrified girl, and every horrified victim before her were captured in its unearthly shrieks. It dragged Shannon's raw body over the hole's jagged shards, plummeting her into a world of shadows beyond the wall. The phone on the counter rang only once before Leonard answered it. He never kept it waiting. He drew the receiver to his ear. It's done, said the voice. Come. Leonard shook. He'd never gotten used to hearing its haunting hiss. He allowed his nerves to settle before going into the closet and grabbing the mop and bucket and rags, then headed to the room where the mess would be waiting. A few hours later, Donnie swerved into the parking spot outside room 11. Wobbly and reeking of whiskey, he jabbed around the door lock with the key, getting lucky on the fourth attempt. He unlocked the door and staggered into the room. Only the cheap lamp on the water-ringed bedside table illuminated it. Shannon wasn't in the bedroom. Donnie glanced at the partially closed bathroom door. Darling? She didn't answer. Seeing the light peeking around the jam... Donnie figured he still might have a chance to make things right, at least until he screwed up again. He ambled to the door and knocked. Darling? She didn't respond. Come on, Shannon. Don't be like that. I just needed to get away for a while. Donnie opened the door and looked inside. He groaned at the empty bathroom. Where could she have gone? She didn't have a car. Maybe Leonard had seen her go. Donnie was near the front door when he heard the sound. Donnie? Donnie? Shannon? That you, sugar? Donnie. How the hell did I miss her? Donnie returned to the bathroom, looked behind the shower curtain, and found it empty. Where you at, babe? Donnie, I need you. The muffled voice was coming from the other side of the wall. 
He went over and leaned his ear close to it. Shannon? What are you doing next door? When she didn't answer, he pounded on the wall. Shannon, quit fooling around and get back over here. Look, I'm sorry I left you to go drinking. Donnie? Can you hear me? The voice whispered. Barely. Look, I'm tired of this crap. I'm coming over there. Donnie, please listen to me. I, I need to be as quiet as possible. Come closer to the wall. Maybe it's important. Donnie pressed his head against the discolored sheetrock. He didn't have time to scream as the hands burst through the wall, grabbed his head and pulled. The phone in the grimy office rang. Leonard answered it on the first ring. He never kept it waiting. I hope you enjoyed The Girl in the Wall, as written by P.D. Williams, and as performed by Danielle Hewitt, Nick Garoff, Olivia Steele, and Jeff Sturdivant. And a little fun fact, The Monster in the Wall was played by yours truly. You can find more of P.D. Williams' work right here on our website, creepypastastories.com, as well on his website, pdwilliamsauthor.com. Also, I've had the great pleasure to narrate a few of P.D.'s stories on my podcast, Drew Blood's Dark Tales. Be sure and check those out. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillinTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Generation Y, a podcast by Wondery. Hosts and friends Aaron and Justin take on infamous cases we're familiar with, like the evil genius bank robbery, the Zodiac Killer, and the Tylenol murders. Feel the rush of discovery from learning new things about old cases with two buddies who have been doing this for over a decade. And what's cooler to me is they also cover lesser known cases, like the case of Kimberly Rico, AKA the Valentine murder, where Kim takes her husband on a romantic weekend that includes a murder mystery play that she of course uses as a cover to murder him for insurance money. See what other motives cause people to not only think the unthinkable, but actually follow through with it. I've always been fascinated with the law and the human mind. When the two come together, it's just awesome. So what are you waiting for? Hop on the true crime terror train and listen in today. You won't regret it. Follow the Generation Y podcast on Amazon Music or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus on Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. I'm your host of the evening, Drew Blood, and it's been a pleasure. And I know it doesn't sound like Drew Blood, but that's because I'm using a new voice. What do you think? <laughs> anyway, check out my very own podcast, Drew Blood's Dark Tales, with a new episode each Thursday night. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>
chilling tales for dark nights. Tales for Dark Nights.